I'm very excited about uh, this particular webinar. So if this is your first Future of Freight um, webinar that you're, episode that you're attending, the general context here is just that I really like talking about logistics technology with people that get excited about it. And it's even more exciting to do that when we have groups of people listening in that also get excited about this stuff. Uh, I, I'm not a, I didn't grow up dreaming about logistics. I think very few of us ever did. And once you start getting into the nitty gritty, you really start to get excited about it. Um, and particularly on that convergence of logistics and technology, which has been reshaping the world. And that's what this series is. It's really looking at different people throughout the stages of the supply chain, speaking to them and understanding their perspective on how everything is changing. So we started off by talking with Eric Johnson from the Journal of Commerce. We've gone through Hapag Lloyd, Agility, Alibaba last time. And, and today, I wanted to take a shift and start looking at this from the perspective of the end customer, the person that every single member of the supply chain and most of the people on this call or people listening in know that they have to provide better service for. And until now, we've stayed away from talking about COVID. We've stayed away from talking about it because a lot of people are talking about it and not everybody necessarily has something important to say, but also because it's taken a while to really understand the full ramifications, right? We're now uh, just a couple of months in, and we're still learning a lot of new things on the supply chain side. But the one definitive thing that I have identified, and I think that almost everybody has, is that it's not a one and done event. COVID is something that we're living with and that we're going to continue to live with for at least a while. So understanding the supply chain ramifications becomes really important. And there's no better company that we can speak to to really understand how COVID ends up impacting global supply chain than Johnson & Johnson. Johnson & Johnson, of course, is one of those companies that actually needs no introduction. If you stretch out your arm, you could probably touch something that was created by Johnson & Johnson. Uh, and within Johnson & Johnson, uh, I'm very, very lucky, very privileged to speak today with Neil Ackerman. Uh, Neil Ackerman runs, uh, is the head of advanced technologies at, for global supply chain uh, for Johnson & Johnson, Johnson & Johnson, sorry, in the Middle East and Africa. Uh, but it's also his background beyond just what he's doing right now in terms of innovation at one of the world's largest companies, both on the CPG and on the pharma side, background that extends across Amazon and Mondelez and just a ton of supply chain tactical, supply chain experience, uh, tactical innovative uh, supply chain experience that I'm really, really excited to, to uh, learn a little bit more about. So Neil, uh, thanks so much for joining. Really excited to have you here. Thank you very much. Really appreciate the invite. Awesome. And, and, and just a you know, reminder before we jump right into the questions, everybody, um, the reason that we just really like talking about this stuff, Fredos uh, or the Fredos group basically extends across two different companies. We have Web Cargo that connects carriers with logistics providers, Fredos.com, which connects logistics providers to shippers. And that's usually the orientation we look at. And I think that this is a very, very important jumping point because today we're looking at the real, really large companies that drive global trade. If you look in the United States, 97% of importers are small businesses, but the 3% of large businesses are, are responsible for over 60% of US imports, right? They end up driving a lot of trade. So, uh, and, and I'm sure Neil can, can talk a lot to that. The most important ramification that we've seen within our prison here at Fredo's is just this wild jump where if you look at um, air and ocean rates from China to the United States since uh, the beginning of the year, we saw this huge spike in air rates uh, as soon as capacity started to drop off. And now we've started to see those air rates normalize a little bit, but ocean rates start to climb. And probably that, that's a, something that a lot of us have identified, but that's a very, very narrow view of just what happens on the air side and the ocean side. And, and I'd like to start this off, Neil, by asking you from your perspective, where you're sitting, what do you see as the biggest supply chain price that COVID exacted? And more importantly, what do logistics providers need to give companies like Johnson & Johnson to overcome those problems? Uh, well, first of all, everyone, thanks for having me today. Um, these are really good questions. I'll, I'll set the context like this. Um, I have, uh, as some of you know, I have a bunch of children, but my number one is my dog, Harley. And Harley, in really was impacted by COVID, right? All of a sudden his supply chain, which was, what does he want? He wants humans home and lots of treats. And all of a sudden the humans are always home and the children are giving a lot of treats. <laughs> and so 
depending upon where you sit in this world of COVID, this is the greatest thing to ever happen to you. <laughs> so I think you're, if, you're implicating if, your dog and being responsible for right. COVID. <laughs> if you're the Ackerman dog, COVID is the greatest thing that has ever happened to you. The children play with you 24-7. They're all locked in the house and there's unlimited treats. If you're me, this is a disaster. The children are home 24-7 and everyone's eating treats. And yes, sometimes they get on my nerves. But so where do I see the exact heaviest price? It's with me. But, <laughs> but um, more, more, I think what you're really getting to here in the question, you know, it depends on the industry, right? I mean, this is, this is about the mechanics of economics and how we think of supply chain and logistics. So overall, there's lots of industries, and I'm not going to talk about the receding demand on all the different industries or the increase of that, that demand, depending upon where you are. Um, I would say that some of the biggest prices you're seeing now are on the food and medical impact. Um, first of all, there has been, I think we'd agree, uh, medical supplies are in great demand. Uh, for pharma, of course, the relatively limited, I would say, disruption. Pharma still gets their drugs out. But what I would say, though, that you're watching and you see in the news is this impact of where generics and active product uh, ingredients are being produced and stored. Um, it's not so simple just to reorient your supply chain, to take it where 70% of it's made and then just move it. Um, and so these are some of the difficulties. Even with food, it's staples like wheat and corn, and it's high value like fish, meat, and fruit. Here, it's a labor market and logistics issue, but the top countries produce most of this high value items, including staples. So. One big thing to watch is time will tell as it gets reoriented or not, or if things just don't change. This will be a big piece to watch where the heaviest supply chain prices is, is contained. Will it, will it stay where it is or will people reorient the design of their supply chain? Now, relative to that design, just like in the human condition, uh, humans tend to really push that the unlikely event will happen more often than not. And so um, following a disaster, a tendency is to uh, believe that a threat is imminent and therefore we must change things. But as we know, feelings certainly change and in this social media life very quickly. And so we'll see how placement, supply, demand and consumer fulfillment will all be executed. Right. Um, so overall, this is where I'm watching these industries. It's not saying the others aren't impacted. I'm just watching these uh, providers uh, for when they talk about working with other big conglomerates um, need to understand that it's an emotional play, that it's not just providing it by giving some technology. You're also uh, dealing with people's 50% uh, of that that situation is their emotional push and pull. Uh, what's really happening with them? How do they think of things? Is the glass half full? Is the glass half empty? What data can you provide them to help overcome and, and determine where is the best place to satisfy their consumers or customer demand? I certainly don't think it's an easy answer, um, but one of the ways that I would suggest as a core service of maybe if I may, where to go play. I would say that um, in the world of demand, you really, it's a good place to focus. You know, more and more important inventory management uh, and, and demand and location of that demand is super, super important. And so the way I look at it is um, you want to navigate the current climate that will require, of course, some new intelligence, resilience, dependency on advanced analytics and machine learning, um, as an example. And so they say, well, how are we supposed to do this? I mean, this is an unknown world. And the top providers come back to me and they take a look at consumer takeaway or downstream data. They implement demand equations, prediction models. 
not so different, um, you know, when Freitos comes up and says, this is where we think the freight rates are going and this is what's going to happen and let's adjust to that. Even by incorporating social media or maybe some geographic impact in your data models. These are services that, that help big companies decide demand and make that a high priority. Some of you folks on the call would call that demand sensing, the ability for a capability and technology to improve a near uh, short-term forecast with some short-term data demand. Um, yeah, it, I agree, really hard, but it's an art and a science. And so uh, that's the core area that I'm looking for and looking to make uh, magic out of something which is you know, really hard, which is, What's the future of demand? Where does the goods need to be? And whoever is the best at figuring that out using all the uh, algorithms and machine learning and future forecasting they can, those will be some of the winners. Let's see well, where it I, goes, my friends. Yeah, I, I, you know, that's, that's a, a fascinating answer. I think that you're the first person we're speaking to when we ask about technology talks about people. And I, and I think that that's such a, or, you know, that relationship. And I think that that's such an important component to bring up um, and m making sure that, you know, definitely the logistics providers and carriers think about the person on the other side of the phone call and you can deliver responses through an API, but the answers that that person is looking for needs to come, you know, from that, from that existing relationship. So, so I think that's, that's a great point. Um, on that kind of demand sensing front, right, there's, there's no baselines right now. Nobody, you know, this, this is, right, like nobody has any clue what's happening. And, and I think that understanding real-time data becomes so much more important. Is that something that large importers or exporters, international supply chain conglomerates, when you typically look for that type of data, do you look internally at your own data and for external sources? Is it mostly on external, mostly on internal? Like, how do you tend yeah. to balance those? First, let's take a look at the output here before we answer the question. What are you really trying to do with demand sensing? Are you trying to reduce your forecast errors, increase your inventory accuracy, optimally deploy your downstream resources and your labor allocations? Okay, so if we know that that's our output, some of the pieces that you would look at would, of course, be the past. We learn from our past, mm -hmm. but it doesn't always dictate our future. We all know this. Um, it's hard to really get your head around, but true. And then when you look at the future, um, you have to take a look at things such as uh, the, the consumer downstream data. What is occurring at takeaway at, let's say, retail stores or hospitals? Um, what are you seeing in different countries and their demand based on when they open or close a facility? What are you watching? Um, what is social media saying? Uh, and how is that impacting different markets that you're taking a look at? You know, you may think your forecast is terrific, but you also know that your daily forecast may not be as efficient. Mm -hmm. And so what you're really trying to figure out is, where do all these pieces come burst externally and internally and at what weight to give you the most accurate forecast and perspective you can get? Mm -hmm. I, I have found that calls such as these and networking with people such as the folks on this call um, is certainly one piece of trying to determine where to place or what to bid on or what to put in. It's certainly can be driven by science, but even with that, you're still going to have a bias of certain percentage that's going to be wrong. Um, and so I always try to look at it and say, do I feel like I have the top three or four external data pieces, the top three or four internal data pieces, and do I have four or five great minds in the room that look at it and say, yep, that's our best shot. Um, and that's how I do it. And I think the theme of this has got to be no one has exclusivity on great ideas. No one. Mm -hmm. And so when you can really bring in those different people into the data magic, you have the combination you need. And, and you know, you know me for years and you know that um, I'm a, I really always tell folks supply chain people are people that have to lead with heart. 
because we're the people on the front line making it on the manufacturing, even during COVID, driving the trucks, moving the packages, you know, going to work to create the widget. And so if you don't have the heart and believe in the people, seeing just the data side is a crappy way to, to get started. And so that's the balance that I would suggest for folks. Gotcha. Thanks. Yeah. And, and I, again, I think it's, that's a great wake up definitely for the logistics tech companies that are listening in on this, where I, I think we, we tend to be a little bit cocky, um, you know, with, within the startup space and think that we have a lot of answers from data. And if Johnson & Johnson knows the importance of looking for both internal and external data, I think that, that that's, that's a good enough wake up call that everybody needs it. And, you know, moving on to, to another question, of course, you come from a, you, you spent a four years, I think, at, at Amazon. And just, I, I pulled a couple of numbers from their Q2 reports, you know, definitely a company that has gotten a little bit of tailwind from the, uh, from uh, COVID. Uh, they had $4 billion in incremental COVID costs, but their numbers went through the roof uh, on yeah. almost every single metric. And, and you spent a lot of time there. One of the biggest areas that certainly smaller importers are, are being shaped by, but is now starting to triple, trickle up market to larger logistics providers is their FBA program. And the fact that there's like million, millions of, of sellers around the world, and, and you're an instrumental part of that uh, in the earlier days at Amazon, at, of your time spent at Amazon. And I'm, I'm curious, you know, there's so much, and I want to call it like thought leadership porn about people that, you know, put up what Amazon's doing and, and points it as the holy grail. And it tends to be a little bit in the kind of Jeff Bezos worship area. But I'm talking specifically on this, which maybe is misplaced, maybe isn't, but um, specifically from a supply chain perspective, there's no question Amazon is doing an impeccable job from supply chain. I'm curious if there's any lessons that you picked up uh, while you were inventing and leading new strategies at Amazon on a supply chain perspective that you think are very relevant for uh, listeners on the call. Well, I certainly uh, appreciate that. I wouldn't call myself any uh, particular expert. I did spend time there and as some of you know, uh, a led strategy for fulfillment by Amazon, which was which is today FBA. Um, and you would say, well, you know, what are some of the lessons? You know, people have written books on this. Um, at the end of the day, um, the way I think about it is is relative to this call today in the logistics space. Um, first of all, it follows even what Freitos tries to do price, right? Uh, no one wakes up and says, I'd like to pay a lot today. So I've learned that, you know, price is one component of this, but you also, the thing that made FBA so special was that it grew selection so fast. And so even when people thought never should have FBA, because now you can have sellers competing against Amazon, the folks at FBA knew that, yeah, that's a short-term thing, but what you're going to do is you're going to drive more selection because you'll have more choices because no one can grow as fast as when you have everyone growing together. And so they had a lot more selection. And when you have a lot more selection, people come to the platform. But you also have prices that go down because sellers compete on price, right? And so a uh, price will drive not to the bottom, but to a fair price where money's being made on both sides and consumers are getting a good deal. Mm -hmm. But no one's going to go back to your site or care about what you're selling if, they, if you can't actually get it. So they invested a tremendous amount of efforts in this idea of convenience. But the thing about convenience is you can say something, and these come to some three very important lessons. One is, you really should be very data-driven with your decisions. Um, I very rarely use um, many different types of adjectives because to me, adjectives are just these words of no data. They're just, oh, that was wonderful. Well, what does wonderful mean? Um, I, I don't know. It depends on who you talk to. Um, so I would say that I've learned, use your words carefully. Uh, be data-driven when you're answering things. But most importantly, whether you're talking about price or selection or convenience or the balance between them, know who your customer is and focus on that customer. These are, you know, they sound simple, but they're really hard. If they were so simple, every other company would doing it before Amazon, but they weren't, you know. And even, you know, 
I, I was uh, raised in the U.S., although right now I'm an expat um, living in the Middle East and Israel. But, you know, there are government agencies that still don't know the, what customer service is, right? They're confused. Um, but you, you know it when you see it. And when you see it, you want more of it. Mm -hmm. And so I would say if someone's going to say, well, what does all this mean? It's simple. Friction equals failure. The more that you can take friction out of the system, the more successful you will be. The more friction you introduce, the more you will fail. Um, and so that's kind of how I picked up some lessons. You know, I hope that's helpful. There's a lot of details uh, about this, but I think for this call and these questions, mm -hmm. I think that does the job. I'm going to... I'm going to see what happens when I tell my wife that our date night was a seven instead of saying it was a wonderful date night. And I'll report back to you on, on how that works for me. Um, but well, I, you I, pick seven. I'm smarter than you. I always say 10. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll, I'll use that. Um, I, I think that's, that's an interesting point from, for me, what, what I think has Amazon has done. And, and this is, I guess, what, exactly what you're saying is that they've defined success as what makes it easier for the customer. Whereas frequently, some, you know, historically, at least a lot of logistics companies have looked at it from a technical perspective, IT success means I'm working internally more efficiently, which usually, but does not always mean that the customer is getting a better, uh, a better experience. Um, so I, I think that's really interesting. I, you know, I see somebody uh, who just asked in the, in the Q&A here, uh, how do you actually define friction, right? If you're talking about, you know, more friction is, is uh, you know, you're, you're trying to avoid that friction. How would you define friction on the supply chain side? I would just say, while you can look up the word friction and there'll be all sorts of definitions, I'm sure on the internet for everyone to look at, um, I just look at it as um, stopping progress. <laughs> so, you know, basically, if you were gonna ask me or my wife what's friction, it's anytime my stress level has gone up, you have caused me friction. <laughs> so, how can you make my day rainbows and cupcakes every day? Because wherever that is, that's what I want. Yeah? Right. So, you know, this is how I look at it. And, and it's a big bar, right? And you're allowed to have the bar very high um, because that's when you know you're climbing for something, you know, that really matters. Gotcha. Okay, and that's how, I, that's how I look at it. Thanks. So I'm moving on, you know, I think back to your, to your current role and back to Johnson & Johnson. Uh, I spent good six, seven, maybe 10 years now reading logistics technology literature. And it felt like for, you know, people have been talking about augmented vision and drones in the warehouse uh, for a long time. And it's actually a really nice picture on the left here is of uh, what I believe they call the Hulk internally at Johnson & Johnson of, of being kind of augmented, uh, picking up packages. And it's nice to see those things actually come to fruition and, and start to really work. From your perspective, what are the most important, beyond data, which, which I think you know, we've, we've touched on, or maybe including data, what are the most important technological components of a supply chain? And I remember a, a conversation we had about specifically the intricacies of uh, pharma at an event back when people were allowed to meet in person. How do you feel like those technology components are different when it comes to pharma? You know, I, I thought about this question because uh, I've been asked it in different ways. And, you know, my perspective has changed, like, like many of you on the call. Actually, pharma, the pharma widgets are really not all that different. As I begin to talk to my friends and benchmark all around the world, one of the advantages of working in Africa and the Middle East and coming from working in North America is you see innovation in ways you never would have expected. Um, the resiliency of the people and the population is just incredible and I can just tell you it's like magic. But what I've learned is even the customers, no matter where they are, like the lessons in question two that you asked, um, they're also saying, I want the best of what I can get, the best selection at the best price and the easiest way that I could get it based on my market, right? Well, based on my situation. So when I think about the most important technological components, you, you make this question very uh, difficult because the most important 
depends on your industry, the customer you're serving, what's their friction levels. Uh, for me, I, I am very, uh, very, very, as you know, bold on the idea of sensors and um, sensors that uh, act as Internet of Things or so can give you data uh, and visibility throughout the supply chain. I'm really big on visibility every which way to know where everything is. Um, so that's a big one for me. The second one that I've been really into besides, as you know, robotics in the past and all that was the autonomous automation or the utilization of robotic process automation. This idea that we can have so much work done that um, humans don't need to be doing that machines can do. And then we can use our brain power to even do more in the innovation space. And I read recently that Gartner said that 50% of all large global companies uh, will be using AI or RPA or these versions of data to reduce their friction, reduce their costs, improve transparency of information flows. So those are the things that um, I, I think are hot besides the what you said, the data or what I'm calling machine learning and analytics. Now, do other people have opinions? You bet. And there's tons of articles all about the opinions that are the most important components. But right now, end-to-end -end visibility, sensors that make magic happen, um, and then being able to use that data to predict demand gets me real excited. Now, one can argue that, you know, but what about inventory? There's such high inventory out there right now in certain categories. Uh, obviously, we've learned that maybe not in toilet paper, but in other categories, <laughs> there are lots of inventory. And, and at the end of the day, yeah, um, that's certainly something that should come down in certain industries as they figure out where to play. But I think high inventory is, um, is a short-term problem right now in certain industries and will level off as they get better at, um, obviously, uh, demand planning, demand sensing, knowing where your inventory is so you don't know where it's not, you don't know where it is. Um, and those are the components that I'm spending the most time thinking about right now. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's fascinating, um, just that idea of, of legibility that you can take, uh, both RPA and sensors at the end of the day, take offline analog information and turn it into digital information that you can then feed into your data processes, uh, which as you started off by saying is so important. Uh, so it's I, I think that it. yeah. to totally makes sense. Um, moving on to, to our, our last like major question, uh, you know, supply chain is obviously a, a very, very complex orchestra uh, that, that needs to be conducted. And when you look out at some of the current CEOs or former CEOs out there, a former CEO of Lego, of Gap, of Old Navy, current CEO of Apple, all come from this supply chain background. Yeah. Uh, and, and I'm curious, looking at that chief supply chain officer background, like, how, is you, how have you seen that role of chief supply chain officer shift over the past couple of years? both in terms of their responsibilities, but this is important. The people on the call tend to work with the chief supply chain officers, or at least, you know, tr try to work with them. Uh, so, so kind of how have you seen that role shift over the past couple of years? It goes from a cost center to a revenue generating machine. That's the shift. Supply chain people are not just the cost center anymore. If you're not clear that supply chain can grow your revenue, just look at the top 10 companies for market cap and they're all heavily driven by supply chain. So this means that the success of a modern organization is relative to the success of their supply chain. And so, yes, you're seeing supply chain leaders at the cusp of all aspects of their organization. Why do I say all aspects? Well, let's take just a, a high level view. The supply chain needs to know the core structure all the way down to the widget. Yes. The supply chain need to know demand of consumers to make it. Yes. Mm -hmm. The supply chain need to know the delivery of how it's going to get from A to B in the logistics. Yes. Um, do they care about marketing? Yes, or else they don't know demand. Do, do they care what the salespeople are selling, and is that linked to their bonus of salespeople? Yes, because they're supplying it. They're putting it in different distribution hubs. Do they care about the globalization of a brand? Yes, because they have to worry about ingredients, about all the different idiosyncrasies of the governments, the borders, 
what are the rules, the regulations, product quality. All of a sudden, supply chain people have to know internal capabilities, external capabilities. Um, if there's counterfeit, they're the ones pointed at, right? Mm -hmm. um, so safety, they're the ones pointed at. Sustainability, they're the ones pointed at. It, it's actually a great place to be in, in, in the world today. I'm so actually happy that I picked it. Honestly, I had no idea what I was doing back then, but it worked out. And I ended up being in a pretty cool industry, I think. Um, the coolest part about it is it deals with multiple cultures and nationalities. And that goes back to the heart again. Plants could be in 30 different countries. You can have a, you know, I'm not kidding, by the way. You can have 30 plants in 30 different countries speaking six languages. So you are really in the game, right? Wouldn't you say you're in the global world? So that has shifted uh, dramatically. Um, and then, of course, I'd say that the current focus is in their end-to-end -end supply chain cost and all the transformation considerations that you're seeing and really having a future that's realistic um, and cost efficient. I think uh, supply chain people also are grounded. Um, I always say that, you know, they're, they're people that, that know people, um, know the importance of the tens of thousands of manufacturing workers going every single day to make the widget. They understand that they are, have a real direct impact on the families that are being supported by that plant or that fulfillment center or that manufacturing plant. These places are like little villages and cities. And the plant manager is the king of that little village and city and is responsible for making sure that those families, and there's thousands of them, that work in these facilities can bring you know, home dollars and monetary value, food to the table, and you know, even more. And I think that's why the supply chain officer even has many aspects of HR right at their belt because they're controlling the pulse, the heart of that company. Um, if Trust me, if the manufacturing people and the delivery people are upset, the company's upset. Everyone will be. Yeah, this is, this is a good rah-rah uh, supply chain speech. I'm going to listen to this in the morning uh, next time I'm bummed out. Uh, Thanks. I, let, let's shift to, to, to a, a couple of, of kind of faster questions over here. Uh, just for the last uh, five or six minutes. What is J&J's or, or your greatest wish when it comes to cargo airlines and innovation on the supply chain side? Uh, if you want me to give fast answers, it's going to be uh, democratize as you're doing the Freitos pricing. Focus on the value given to the customers. Don't focus on the secrecy. We don't need that. We need democratization of the data and, the, and that. And so we could focus on the best customer service. Um, second, another great wish could be we have to collaborate even more together to satisfy consumer needs, and that could mean combining shipments and aggregating them. Um, and I guess the last part of my fast answer would be um, I, I wish that the world would stop thinking about the metric on time in fill, OTIF, as important. It's on time in full delivered and used by the consumer. Mm. So I think it's really important that it's not just delivered. How many times do I deliver it, but I don't open my Amazon box for three days. It sits there on time, infilled, delivered, ordered, and used. Mm. Okay. So I know it's a big wish, but you asked my wish and you told me I have just a few minutes left. So I'm trying to go through the question. I love that. I love that. And that's the consumer orientation or end user orientation, which is great. Probably the most important question here, what is your favorite pizza topping? Oh, well, that's off the top. Oh, I like uh, fresh mushrooms. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know why, but that's, that's my favorite Fair. pizza topping. Fair. I, I do pineapple, so that's even stranger. Um, how do you see technology transforming the freight sector? Um, or how do you see increased operational efficiency through fleet utilization? Just is a hard question to do fast. <laughs> um, I'll do it fast. I, I mean, you know, you can take every piece I said before, but here's kind of what I would add. I think that as far as transforming the, the, the freight sector and increasing the efficiency and all that kind of stuff, what you're really asking is, 
I see technology helping for J and J to supply hope or pioneer the future of healthcare end to end. So the freight sector and the operations of their fleet is a very important part of supplying uh, hope to people as they want to get healthy. Um, and of course, doing that for a better healthcare by having visibility end to end in real time, knowing the status of all the, of the products, seeing how it's used, delivering it safe with high quality, that's not counterfeit, that's on time. So when someone has a surgery, the parts are there, right? The pieces are there. And so, yeah, everyone on this call has a really big deal in this ecosystem. If you can't deliver it and understand that you are a big part of the mission, then I think you should turn back and really rethink how you're looking at your, your role. Because without you, the items don't show up, mm -hmm. right? So we need you and we need you to be, have a lot of heart and, and know that you're supplying hope to people in their treatments, especially during this COVID environment. Great, I totally agree. Um, you know, I'm skipping forward to one question just because we have two more uh, minutes. Favorite, are you a business book person? Do you do business books? Do you have a favorite one? I, I do a lot of books. I enjoy many books. My favorite author, I think would be best here, is uh, Malcolm Gladwell. Um, mm -hmm. If you don't know him, I would suggest everyone Google him. He has uh, many great books, and it really makes you think about uh, other people. I'm, I'm really obsessed with behavioral economics, mm -hmm. why people do what they do. It, it actually, and in this day and age, if you've been following the media or the politics at all, you probably are wondering, why do people do what they do? And I find these books by, uh, let's say, uh, uh, Malcolm Gladwell or Daniel Arelli fascinating um, mm -hmm. about behavioral economics. And, uh, and I would suggest you all take the time to really understand what is motivating people and why do they do what they do. I know why Harley the dog does what he does. <laughs> One word, food. Right. You know? And I know why my daughter does what she does. One word, candy. <laughs> that's it so yeah um all right last question to uh, to wrap this up from a tech perspective freight carriers tend to be a little bit behind and this isn't my this is a question that got submitted i'm actually not 100 percent sure I, I i agree with that but do you believe there's any collaboration with industry leaders that can improve information exchange right because that's how, i mean you talked before about yeah OTIF. yeah i mean what one like the the, the con in hands of a consumer with the consumer using it means that the carrier actually needs to get some type of information from the company as well, right? So we need, a, we need better information exchange. Do you feel like there's an important collaboration that can happen? Yeah, it goes back to this important thing. No one has exclusivity on good ideas. No one. And if you think you've been in the industry for 30 years and you know it all, then please get out of the room because no one knows it all. And we're not interested in egos. We're interested in partnerships and learning from each other. And so you're even finding more and more that that is what's happening and that's what's happening in our industry as well. Um, I would say that what this comes down to is people with strong emotional intelligence that know how to partner with people, know how to exchange in responsible, legal, and respectful ways. That's a group that I'd want to be a part of. Amazing. Okay. Well, uh, you know, Neil, this, this has been uh, really, really fascinating. I, I really enjoyed uh, the opportunity and I really enjoyed the insight. So thank you so much for uh, spending a little bit of time with us today. Uh, we really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. I had a great time. Awesome. Take care, everyone. Okay, thanks very much. And everybody will be continuing. We're actually gonna be taking the next time uh, off. Uh, so two weeks where we will not be having one uh, for August, but we'll be back in the beginning of September with a couple of airlines, some more logistics technology startups, a large ocean liner and more. So thanks so much and thanks, Neil. Uh, have a great day, everybody.